Hi, I'm Maria, Maria Sullivan of Papiago Rescue House, and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we are so fortunate. I'm so excited to share with you that Professor Gisela, uh, Gisela Kaplan, she is an emeritus professor of animal behavior and uh, specializes in, she's, I'm sorry, specializes in primate and bird behavior, especially native Australian birds. Um, there's like nearly 900 of them, uh, so that's a lot to keep up with. At the University of New England, Amadel, New South Wales, Australia. And so that's where she is talking to us from tonight. Well, hers is today. Of course, Yeah, yeah. today uh, versus our tonight, or last night. Um, Kisela has two PhDs, an honorary doctor of science for special contributions to the field. Um, and wow, she has a, a amazing amount of documentation. Uh, she's written 23 books and over 250 articles and papers. And that's where I found her. Um, now she's always been found, but I, f I uh, do a lot of research uh, for our birds in captivity, and I actually um, have to recommend, f before I go any further, for you to uh, see her uh, Bird Minds book. Uh, it is available uh, via Amazon. I can uh, uh, put the link in um, at after our uh, live video. But anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hi. Well, great uh, pleasure and honor to be with you. It's lovely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and a now, good evening to you. <laughs> yes, it is evening. Uh, last night for you. That's kind of, that's that's something for me to wrap my head around still. Um, yeah, 15 hours um, ahead. We, we have nice, just had morning tea. Oh, nice. Nice. I just had dinner, and um, I have to say that I was very excited. I I have hardly slept at all last night thinking about our conversations, as I've read so much of your work, uh, especially with uh, parrots. Um, of course, there's so much more to you than just parrots, but today we're wanting to talk to you about parrots, parrots in captivity specifically in the home. Uh, because, uh, as we know, uh, that is very impactful to these very intelligent uh, species. They're one of the five most intelligent species on Earth. And um, I know some birds that are some smarter than some people. And I'm not knocking the people. Um, I'm, I'm saying that... Um, yeah, that's, that's not a cut on people. They're very intelligent. And so I was, I, I'm hoping that this is actually going to be um, a year long discourse uh, that you share your knowledge with us because uh, not only have you, you've lived your, so you've lived, you've taught, uh, you've rescued, you've uh, witnessed parrots in native environment, uh, in captivity. And that's, uh, aside from just getting your books, having you come and talk to us about that. I know people are anxious for you to, s to start talking instead of listening to me. Um, so I wanted to, to, to get us started with something that has been on my mind for some time and I'm hoping that uh, we'll go from here. Um, so the U.S. has been closed to imports since 1992. And I think that's good. I don't think we should be importing birds, uh, especially knowing what I know of them now. Uh, some of my best friends are parrots. Um, I, I do worry, though, about how that, will I that impacts the uh, gene pool, uh, the closed gene pool of our birds. Do you see that affecting our birds uh, long term, uh, not only just in behavior, but in their standards? Uh, their, the, how long do you think 
or are we or am I worrying about nothing? Oh, that's a very good question. But before we start on that, did you notice something about my outfit, what I'm wearing? Um, it's exactly the blouse uh, in which you advertised <gasps> this talk. That's right. That's why I picked it's it. Exactly, I thought I had to do this and to lead us straight into one topic is clothes. And uh, if I wear, if I interact with parrots, I always wear the same clothes. Mm. Any idea why I would wear the same clothes? Uh, besides recognizability, comfort? Well, yeah, well, that's the, the most important thing, recognizability. You know, people don't think very much of what the bird sees. But if you ask how many cockatoos or suffer crested cockatoos could you distinguish each from the other, oh. the answer is pretty much nil. Right. They all look exactly the same to us. Now, what if we turned this around and said every human looks the same to them? And the only way to distinguish them is actually by the clothes. And there are some clothes when people I see them with these big checkered, vibrant colors. Now, that's scary, absolutely scary for right. a bird because these colors mean something in the natural environment, like, you know, yellow or red is a color of danger. Right. And uh, so if you wear that, you're not going to make friends very easily with a parrot. And <laughs> so that's one thing. And if you wear something different each day, you are very unlikely to make friends with them because they think somebody else comes every day. Mm -hmm. See, the tone of voice can help them recognize you. But it's really, first of all, as a period of um, introduction to a bird and to make it feel at ease is to wear the same clothes and no big patterns, no big colors, but the same mm -hmm. and an assuring voice. So there's your start. So I felt obliged to wear exactly the same blouse he'd <laughs> chosen in the photograph. <laughs> so I was interrupting, but uh, back to the gene pool. Uh, you know, it's interesting because birds don't have a domestic uh, domestication history as dogs and cats do. Right. So there are, in to all intents and purposes, only a few generations, and we really ought to consider them as uh, wild Mm -hmm. and not as companion animals. Oh. And then we have a chance to treat them well. Mm -hmm. So you see that there's a big difference. Dogs have been in human company for, I don't know how many thousand years. Oh, yeah. And so have cats. And uh, in the process, so have horses for many years. There's a process of domestication, and that changes the nature of the beast, so to speak. And there are some ground characteristics that the dog shares shares with humans the social the aspect the socialization the loving context of the environment so they can adapt fairly readily but that adaptation has been very much engineered by humans for many thousands of years and uh, we haven't done that with birth so straight from the wild and we put them into an entirely alien world world and then on top of that that alien world has started with trauma so mm -hmm. if you say you know export many countries forbid exports uh, of, of their native birds now but the uh, poaching percentage is enormous mm -hmm. and uh, that's still the greatest risk to parrots because they're colorful and if you live somewhere in the jungle and you belong to a um, I mean, there are some very nasty and greedy people who just put them in socks and cart them around and uh, 60 to 80 percent of birds die in transport. But uh, the, um, the ones that really um, poach them because they need the money. So that's too tempting. And that's still happening. So they start with trauma, but they're taken from the wild. So we have as a genetic pool in some species only a few generations, not even 50 years or not even 100 years. Right. And against thousands. So, you know, that's important to bear in mind. So we've got to tune in a little more to them. And I think um, 
cheat pools can be worked out, but it's better to have an active breeding if birds are already decided upon as pet birds. And we could argue about that, you know, yeah. which birds yeah. are suitable. And I think birds that live 80 to 100 years are not suitable for uh, as pet birds for the simple reason that you can't live up, you can't be their parent or companion for their lifetime, you see. Right. In dogs, it's easy. We are, we are well matched because we're not well matched, actually, because there's so much pain when you lose a dog, when it lives for 10 to 15 years. But we're talking in, in some uh, birds, even in the basic songbirds of South America in Australia, we're talking about 15 to 29, uh, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So you asked me about the magpie. They can live to 30 years. I just buried my favorite tawny frog mouse, and uh, he was 29 years old. Oh, wow. So, oh. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's not even a parrot. And when we get to South Crest and Gorgeous or Galas, Galas live for 80 years, and uh, uh, the pumpkin, our our well, South Crest and Cockatoo, is now 50. He's a man in his bef best years. He can live to 100 easily in captivity. Yeah. or sometimes yeah. longer. And uh, you have to think very hard. You know, when you get a budgerigar, that budgerigar lives for perhaps for uh, 13 to 18 years, and that's more or less the lifespan of a dog mm -hmm. or a cat and something you can share and you can promise you're going to look after that one bird as your pet and befriend it and make it part of the family. But if you have a bird that lives for eight years, you need three generations of people. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I think I can hear your dog in the background, speaking of dogs. <laughs> yes, it's a big Rhodesian Ridgeback. Ah, nice. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we have our budger regards. Uh, we call them affectionately budgies. And I have to say that they're our most surrendered bird. Um, and the way that we have fed them um, has done them such a disservice that their lives, their poor little lives, um, are, are even down to five years, five to eight years. And we're trying to Gosh. change the, uh, yeah, we're trying to change that by not feeding them a strictly seed diet, uh, giving, uh, giving them bigger cages, um, enclosures i'd like to call them but um some people um we have some people on the spectrum where they uh let them out all the time some uh or all the all the time and then some that have them in these small enclosures that pet stores sell um as a, a very ill-advised uh way of keeping them very small um but they're they're our most surrendered bird, but they've got to be by double. I mean, not just a little bit, double. And they are the most interesting, smartest, uh, engaging parrots ever. Ever. They're amazing. <laughs> yes. Very strong. And they bond very strongly. And they're very charming. And They uh, are. I had a budgerigar when I was nine years old, and it um, had 375 words, quite clearly pronounced, and it also announced the morning news. He did. So do you think at nine years old, you were already starting to project toward uh, going into what you have done your, really basically your whole life? Well, I don't know whether, uh, you know, I think it's just a way of empathy when you t or perspective taking. I remember how sorry I felt for the little bird to be all on its own and to be shoved into this family. And I felt so guilty when I got this bird as a present. And I thought, well, I have to try to make it nice for the bird. So I spent at least two hours playing with it each day before I went to school and then after I came back. And uh, the bird became so tame that I did my homework with the uh, buttery gal on the shoulder. And uh, then I had questions and answers, as you know, probably the work of Irene Pepperberg. 
And uh, my budgerigar answered uh, as well, you know, two and two, how much is that? And so the bird would say four. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so he was a very clever bird. And at some stage, the bird decided I had done enough homework and um, he flew in and grabbed my uh, biro and uh, pulled it away so I couldn't write anymore. <laughs> and would get quite naughty. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you remind me a lot of Jane Goodall. Have you ever met her? Yeah, uh, yes, yes. Pathology stuff, and we went to Uganda uh, and various conferences around the world where, where we met always, and she was always present at those conferences, particularly if it was to do with um, uh, apes or um, uh, rescue and education, you know, education of people on how to think of, um, of primates and why they're important in dealing in themselves. So, yes, uh, uh, and uh, of course, she had a way of observing them, which was so detailed and patient that some of the best data of their behavior we have from them. So I do the same. I spend hours with the birds when they're free and outside. And, mm -hmm. you know, Australia, as you know, is called the land of uh, parrots. Mm -hmm. So I've got four species in the garden. It's very easy to do observations. Mm -hmm. Well, regular. Um, you know, uh, and, and I... I, I I can understand why Australians uh, see cockatoos uh, as a, a pest when they're in those huge amount of numbers. When I only have 18 big ones and they will cause damage just with whatever they can reach. I mean, not like kind of minimal damage. Um, but like severe damage, like they're taking the house down to the studs and then they'll take the studs down. Um, cockatoos uh, is a, 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 everybody wants a cockatoo. Everybody loves a cockatoo. Um, made very popular with uh, a long time ago with a TV show in, in my day called uh, Beretta. Uh, and they have been long-term in the pet trade. What's your thoughts on cockatoos uh, in, in the pet trade, in captivity, um, and specifically, how do we reconcile that for them, or do we, or can we? Well, that's a difficult one to answer. I mean, you know, with... Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, let me correct you. The, uh, the big flocks only occur when there's a particularly bad shortage of food. Oh, they flock okay. together and uh, the corellas are the same. They're also cockatoos. Yeah. Normal travel yeah. size for cockatoos is between 7 and 20 maximum. So if, that's a couple of families traveling together for safety. And uh, if they, when they forage and they found good grounds, they separate out into one family, and that's mum and dad and the kids and perhaps an aunt or something. So about five to seven birds. That's it. That's in the natural world the size of, of a flock of, gala, of galahs or of um, um, south of crested cockatoos. So they're not um, in, occurring in these large flocks. So the corellas and the cockatoos, as you rightly say, occur in very large flocks, but we've had years of climate uh, warming and absolute horrific heat waves that didn't last for a day. Most birds can survive a heat wave that comes suddenly and goes into the 110, 120 Fahrenheit um, for a day or two, but then the heart gives out. They just can't deal with that. So they have to escape and they escape anywhere to look for water, coolness, and food. And if they can't find it because there's already a drought, the flocks get bigger and bigger. And so you get these monstrous flock sizes. Oh. And people have, have even thought, oh, no, they are reproducing so quickly. No, 
cockatoos are the slowest reproducer and they don't reproduce at all if there's a catastrophe right. or fire or drought. They don't reproduce. What they do is that there is not only safety in numbers, but one of us needs to be clever enough or has experiences where they... So it's, it's about the memory. Can you tell us where there's still a speck of food somewhere? And then they travel with this thought for hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles to find a spot. And unfortunately, those spots are the ones that we like most, the green, coasty, warm, pleasant, um, and moist areas. Mm -hmm. So that's where these encounters happen. And uh, people think, well, you know, they are uh, taking over the world. No, they're probably coming from all over Australia in desperation. And I said, if you start thinking of the cockatoos that fly in these large flocks as desperate refugees, I well, said, so not everybody is terribly uh, partial to the idea of refugees or illegal immigrants, but sure. uh, that's what they are. Uh, so there is an exodus from these dangerous areas that goes straight into uh, the occupied areas, and that's what you get. And you have the same behavior in humans. Suddenly get 20, 30,000 going across waters or amassing right. at borders because they, they're desperate enough to move and intelligent enough to move. You need to be quite intelligent to, to make that uh, trip into the unknown. Right. Gisela, uh, I, I wonder why they're always showing that to us um, here in the U.S. They're always showing how the farmers are trying to deal with large numbers. Not that this matters in the scheme of things. I was just, you know, we all, uh, all of our countries deal with some kind of form of propaganda. I'm just wondering if you know why that they would show that to us as their bane of existence. Well, the, because they have formed the, they don't know the reasons why they come in these large numbers. And let's face it, South across the cockatoos have one of the most unattractive voices I have ever heard. <laughs> oh my God, thank <laughs> when, you. I have been telling when they people scream, this. I mean, it really is appalling. But you see, even that has a function because the, they, the only thing that's a danger to them are big birds of prey. Mm -hmm. And when they fly, they scream their loud calls. <laughs> and that is a deterrent to the raptors. Yeah. It isn't meant to annoy anybody. It's meant to keep them alive. So, and when they feed, they're totally quiet. It's when they fly that, or are intent on flying, that they have to do that just to keep themselves alive. Because uh, the raptors in Australia would easily eat a galah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they could even take a self-equestered cockatoo. So, you know, the wedge-tailed eagles are about the golden uh, eagle size. So they're massive birds. And uh, so they do that, but that's a very unattractive part of them. The attractive part of self-requested cockatoos, I think, is uh, that A, once they have found a route across the landscape where there is food at certain times of year, they will stay fairly close to that. And unless, unlike the reputation they have in some quarters that they are so destructive, they're actually, uh, that's an important adaptation. They prune trees. Yeah. And they take the bark off and take the grubs out, and that makes the trees survive. So in the ecology of Australia, yeah. it's hugely important. If they have enough space to move about uh, uh, to do their job, you know, you let them do their job. And I belong to an advocacy, um, a bird advocacy organisation. I'm the patron of it well, in South Australia. And uh, we've argued the damage that they uh, potentially do, let's say, in apple orchards or whatever, is because they have no other food source to consider. So we are creating corridors outside and plant trees and plants and ah. have feeding tables that they find attractive. They said you can't throw somebody out who's hungry right. and don't offer an alternative. And if you offer an alternative, they're very happy to leave you. They're not keen to be in our midst. They're they, it's a daring act because they, they're hungry, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're doing that with enormous success. The um, 
apple growers have increased their harvest. In fact, even the small ones now, the first ones we've trialed the system of the turn, they have increased their harvest by $1 million. Wow. <coughs> That's awesome. So, you know, and so the farmers are on side with saving the, and be nice to the, uh, to the parrots, but, mm -hmm. uh, and give them alternative fruits where they can survive the hot summers and have sufficient food where they can also roost at night and without being taken down, A, by cats, by the enormous number of cats, yeah. or uh, all uh, by raptors. And all of the uh, lorikeets and the smaller parrots, they go into the canopy mm -hmm. and they almost disappear. Mm -hmm. So when they raid an apple orchard, you can't see them. Mm -hmm. You can only hear them chatter, chatter, chatter. And when they go away, half the apple is gone. And what's self quest cockatoos, it's even worse. I take the whole thing apart and then take the uh, uh, kernels. And of course, that's not very healthy for them. Mm -mm. So we wanted to get them out. But they, they listen to reason. Mm -hmm. They just want to survive and be relatively safe. So, well, yeah, when we have but, them in captivity, um, we do recommend to people to give them a lot to do, a lot to chew on. Would so they have to bite, preen, and chew. Um, I like your little um, uh, uh, circle that you have on your uh, opening on your website what you do with them. And uh, you're absolutely right uh, that the lot of activity is very good. And again, in, in, in my work, I watch most of the birds in the wild. So I know what their normal rhythms are. Mm -hmm. And they're forever busy bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, in incredibly busy bodies all the time. I mean, the suffer crested cockatoos may rest for about half an hour and then they're on the move again. So normally, if there is enough food around and available, they will be on the move and evaluate. And they probably know about 100 different plants that are edible to them. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point that I wanted to uh, capture right there, is that a lot of times people have a difficult time introducing their cockatoos uh, or any of their parrots to new foods. Uh, not realizing that we haven't taught them that it's not poisonous, um, that because they move from a home to another home, to them, they have moved to a different territory. And so I try to get people to understand if uh, that eating or having them come to the dinner table, if they're in captivity, um, that uh, an eating uh food with them helps them ex or understand that this is food that they can eat. Would you concur with uh, the thought of, like that? Yes, and you can't teach them early enough because one of the problems is that uh, if you just buy seeds from a store, <sighs> they don't learn anything about the variety of foods they can eat. And it's very important that they have a sense of appearance, structure, color, and even smell and taste yes. um, of what it is they can do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very important because they can also get, they're very suspicious, like ravens, yes. of fairly yes. neophobic, um, meaning they then very suspicious of anything new. And in some parrot species, once you have trained them on one or two food items, you can't ever get them off there. They stay with that one item. And if that happens to be deficient, which it would be, mm -hmm. you're, you're having a problem with the health of the bird right from the bird go. Mm -hmm. So uh, we turn that uh, when I raise a parrot or cockatoo or whatever, it's always a bit of a competition. The parrots like play fighting and competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to have half of that piece of whatever I've given and uh, you know there you are you have to fight for it and it struggles back and holds on with a beak and has a mm -hmm. whale of a time and once that's established then you can introduce them to more things but you have to somehow say you can eat this you know mm -hmm. and when the bird trusts you and you pluck something from that particular berry bush or a flower 
and give it directly to the bird, it can learn that. And that's what the parents do, basically. Mm -hmm. They teach by example. They may not do active teaching necessarily, but the fact that they eat that means it's safe for me to eat. So I do all those uh, things. Look, probably very silly. <laughs> Just no. in the garden and the bushes. <laughs> I wish so I could if do neighbors that. Don't could know, do that. If neighbors don't know what you're doing, it does look a little <laughs> But yeah. it is a very good method. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, they just learn to accept a variety of foods and it keeps the bird healthier. Yes, and we are, we're constantly um, advocating uh, that they're, they, they're constantly grazing, but there's not a lot of room in that crop. So we need to give them a choice of the most nutritious foods possible, starting with vitamin, vitamin A rich foods. Um, and you know that that's harder. It, get, it becomes harder to do because you're going to the supermarket. Uh, you're not going out to the garden. You're not picking it from there uh, where they're indigenous from. They're not indigenous to here. So the food we have is not indigenous to them. And they're so... Um, I feel like we have to be even more careful. Uh, so we do advocate um, like steamed sweet potatoes, carrots, uh, uh, a lot of beta carotenes. Um, and of course, that is a tall order, feeding a parrot a balanced meal throughout the day. That's uh, you, You're absolutely right. And... Uh, but, you know, one good thing, I mean, we can do this uh, locally. Gadachi is uh, one tree that grows very, very quickly. And uh, it produces these big uh, kind of apple-like uh, fruit. And uh, the bigger cockatoos absolutely love them. And they grow very quickly. And I think in some cases it's even useful to have a little um, greenhouse and grow some of these bushes because you have uh, always a supply of food, not necessarily for 12 months of the year, but perhaps for three months of the year. Mm -hmm. And these particular, uh, you're quite right, these particular foods are very high in antioxidants and very high in vitamin C in general, and some of them in vitamin K. And uh, Vitamin uh, K, yeah, that's very important. Yeah, and uh, there's also a grass that grows in Australia, native grass, that looks like a little carrot by the leaves when you just look at the leaves. And they have bulbous fruits. Mm -hmm. And uh, the corellas, for instance, but also the uh, sulfur crossed cockatoos dig them out, nicely spaced. They don't wreck a whole lawn. They sort of aerate them. And they eat the bulbs, and that is the carotene they get from the fruit. So, and it's very fresh and it comes from the soil. And that means the soil also has some of the, uh, the not just the vitamins, but the, it has yes. the uh, minerals. Yes, and they that, need that the, too. The trace yeah, so basically what uh, one can say, the birds need four food groups just as much as, as we do. Mm -hmm. But the weight is shifted to a preference of, one thing over a lot of others uh, you know we have to teach people to eat a very balanced diet mm -hmm. some p cultures are almost exclusively meat eating yes still sure. to this day and some are almost completely vegetarian and there are some cultures i know that doesn't sound good in the united states are insect eating yes which of course is a very good thing to do in terms of <laughs> Well, reducing I, the impact on the earth, but I couldn't eat them. <laughs> no. Well, I, I understand that insects have more protein, uh, especially considering um, uh, the, the way that our cattle, uh, our pigs, and our... But I've, I've had to actually advise people and still get into... Uh, sometimes unpleasant discourse with people because they want to feed their birds chicken bones because they're convinced, Ooh. yes, they are convinced that 
it didn't hurt my bird, so therefore, and they love it, so therefore they should have it, and it's good for them. And I really struggle with some of our archaic thoughts. It's like, hurry up, guys, catch up, because we need to take better care of our birds. Feeding them chicken bones because they're, I don't know can where. Kill them. Yeah, I don't know where the perception is that they need to get the bone marrow out of there. <laughs> no, that's like, who gave them that idea? Is. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Um, no, that's definitely and and the bone itself is so sharp and brutal, it uh, it can ruin their guts and uh, and kill them instantly. Aside, and uh, you know they they're the, insectivorous them, and and they eat fruit and they eat grasses but they don't they're not meat eaters uh, and bones are dangerous they're dangerous even to dogs if you give dogs well, raw yes. bone well we all seem to know uh, that about dogs but we're yeah, much more advanced that's to taken a long time yes, true. Time. that's true yeah yeah um so it, if you, for your gala that you had until he was 82, um, what did you feed It doesn't him? mean I was, I'm 82, all it means, <laughs> so I got the bird when it was 75. You, you got him when he so was 75, had, but he left, he, he lived till 82? Another seven, another seven years, yeah. Oh, okay. So, you know, again, the surrendered suffer cursed cockatoo I have now, I've had him for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, because he can't fly and can't be released, but uh, uh, there's no way I had to make a, uh, my last will, including passing on on to a close friend who is considerably younger and uh, as part of the uh, uh, you know estate mm -hmm. because right. you need to actually allow for that because he's now only fifty, so fifty years. If yeah. he lives another He's 30 to 50 yeah, I years, say, 30 years, I'm sure that I'm not going to be around. And, uh, you know, that bird will suffer terribly with the loss. So we're introducing the friend now and say, look, um, at least 10 years are necessary for this bird to feel comfortable yeah. to be handed over to somebody else. Thank you for bringing that up because I do know it takes, I tell people, you got to slow your roll when you bring a new bird in. They're waiting days to weeks, expecting change, expecting them to be happy, embracing them, being comfortable. Mm. And I tell them, you won't see that for a whole year at least. And it depends on the species because African greys uh, can take easily five to seven years to be comfortable in a home. How long did your uh, bird take to get comfortable with you, do you think? Well, that that bird that uh, was surrendered had been horribly abused. It had been beaten, and just about every bone in its body had been broken. Oh, geez. And uh, yeah, it couldn't fly, it couldn't walk. So we had several x-rays done, and we were speechless because just about every wing had several fractures, and the legs had several fractures. And it had lost all its feathers. So it was a very sorry sight. And it took me five years of a patient daily interaction for the bird to come out of this catatonic uh, kind of stereotype behavior. It was just moving its head around and plucking itself. And today he owns the household and he insists on everybody who comes has to please be admitted first via him. He'll shout the whole, screech the whole house down if the visitors don't come and say hello to him first. And once he's seen them, he's sort of gracious okay. enough to allow them into the house. And uh, uh, then he stops screeching. But um, that has become a rule. There's nobody in the house who can visit this place without saying hello to Pumpkin. Oh, we're in trouble with all the neighbors. <laughs> well, I have to say that um, when you have a group of them, say about 18, uh, anybody new who walks into uh, their area is summarily uh, abraded 
uh, upbraided about being there without their permission. And so they're driven right back out um, because they get really loud. And the sulfur crested are the worst shriekers, in my opinion. Umbrellas, uh, yeah, they can sometimes, especially a female can get up there. But yeah, the sulfur crested are are, and I'm glad to know that they, they do that by design because I have often said those guys are the loudest. And even even though Nande Conyers have been recorded at 170 dBs, I still think a sulfur crested can top that. Well, it's a little bit like a supersonic uh, fright right. trino line coming when that happens but you see even that's an adaptation to a huge outback in Australia there is nothing other than sky there's nowhere for any of the birds to hide right and if they can't hide anywhere they become a target for birds of prey so the way they have dealt with it is to form a cordon of noise and make it as unpleasant as they can make it which is actually successful. Yes. So you see, they may have to fly the whole day and see no tree to roost and see no single blade of grass to eat. And uh, so if they want to get to another area, they are very exposed. Yeah. And there is no, no Australian bird that uh, has, with any self-respect, that travels on its own in the outback. They all travel in groups. And um, budgery guys can travel in groups of thousands. Oh, I love to watch uh, them fly together. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic because they look for water. Mm -hmm. And if they find a water hole somewhere, they all descend. Then the birds of prey are right next to it. But as long as they're in this whirly group, birds of prey have enormous difficulties catching even one. And... Uh, Water also means they're opportunistic breeders. So the moment there's water, yes, the uh, male says to his female, "Here we go, girl. Time to have a family," and they get into it straight away because the water holes disappear in about uh, a month. Yeah, and that's how much time they have. So they, uh, you know, busy, busy. Ask their missus, and that can happen several times a year, and it may not happen several at all for several years, depending on the conditions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, there are good ecological reasons for all of this, mm -hmm. but if they're happy in captivity, they don't actually shriek because they know they're safe. Mm -hmm. So, shrieking means partly being bored or in pain or, or fearful. fearful. Yeah, fearful is is a thing uh, especially when yeah. a stranger walks in that's their stranger danger yeah. yell and yeah. it it's almost uh exaggerated um their shrieking is exaggerated when a stranger comes back uh, into their area um and i understand the fear the fear uh screech is different than boredom um, it's yep. almost, uh, their boredom is almost a lower pitch, a little bit lower, yep. but it's kind of a I wish you could record that sometime. Oh, this I is could. So, I would love to work on that because, uh, you know, when you can distinguish by ear already, oh, yeah. that uh, yeah. could be a very nice start to a very nice project because uh, you can then also more easily assess what the bird is experiencing. People have great trouble with the idea that birds have emotions and are fearful and can be loving and can be um, close and bonded and can be joyous. And like Michael R even has a sense of humor. He has a, a ridiculous sense of humor. That uh, You know what he did? Hmm. Do you want to hear it? Oh, I yes, didn't have of time course. for you yes. to hear it. Yes, yes. Oh, we have time. Well, uh, this uh, Galar, the 75-year-old, came at death's door and was so weak, and I pepped him up and got him back to normal and trained him to be with us in a small aviary at night for roosting next to the dining room table. 
it turned out the he then only ate at night when we were sitting down for a dinner. So we had regular dinners from then on. Well, and we didn't grab food on the run because he was waiting for us. And the moment we had the first bit of food, he started eating. And I trained him to walk out. He couldn't fly either. He had a broken wing um, to a big aviary outside. And I said, I'm not taking you and carrying you. You can do this yourself. So he walked out, waddled out every day to his outside aviary and uh, learned that very well and was very happy with that. And then he learned the name of the dogs, four Rhodesian Ridgebacks. And uh, these four Rhodesian Ridgebacks had names that I'm sure he probably had never heard before, like Riker and uh, Luke, perhaps, but, uh, you know, uh, names like that. And um, one day I uh, looked at him and he was walking from his night roost down on the floor, still in the living room, looking out, and he started calling the dogs. <laughs> and he did such a good imitation of my voice. <laughs> Julie, Luke, Riker, <laughs> they all came running and lined inside the living room. You know, Gala is only this big, and the Rhodesian Ridgeback is a fairly substantial dog. Yeah. And uh, they sat down on their behind front paws there. One, one dog, Sarah, didn't want to, and uh, <laughs> Philip was his name. He hissed. He absolutely hissed at the dog and then it fell into line. So there you are. Oh, gosh, there's a phone call. I hope that didn't matter. And, uh, uh, well, once he had called in all the four dogs that were sitting in front of him, there's the little galah, there are the big dogs all facing them. And he said, look at that, ha, huh. said, and walked off. And he swayed and swaggered with his head absolutely delighted what he had achieved. Absolutely delighted. <laughs> uh, I, I love seeing birds, parrots be, uh, I mean, they're so self-aware. They know what they're doing. They know, they even are able to manipulate people and circumstances to um, achieve what their goal is for the day. And all of our cockatoos are in their cages uh, because they want to be. Because if they don't want to be in there, they will take the door, the screws off of the door. So when I open it, the, the whole door will come off in my hand. Yes. And they will think that's funny. Yes. And while yes. I'm, I am dealing with the uh, door going to the floor, making a bunch of racket, it's like all of the birds are already in on it. And I swear, I hear them laugh. I hear them laugh at me, but that's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm there for their amusement. Um, but I, I want to uh, uh, just ask one more question because I know that we're gonna look to see if we have any questions. Um, how do we, I know this is a big question, so forgive me for asking. It, and it's because and it's like it's longer than what we have but i am hoping that we will continue this dialogue but if you had one piece of advice one word of wisdom uh well more than one word uh a, a piece of advice for people who have parrots in their homes to making them the happiest they can possibly make them what would you tell them Well, uh, I, it would end up as a, as a list uh, of things. One of them, don't stroke them on the back. Right. Don't. And uh, one of them is, when does a bird in the wild experience something on its back? Uh, it's either mating, and that's very brief, and it's consensual, and it's, mutually agreed with verbal signals beforehand and, and vocal signals beforehand, um, or a bird of prey mm -hmm. grabs yeah. a, or a cat usually grabs it on the back. So the back is the area that most generates fear. And some of the birds actually can eject their feathers yeah. as a last resort 
in order to get away. So I see there's an absolute, almost compulsive need by humans to stroke an animal and constantly. Touch them. On the, on the head, and even some dogs are worried. When you come at them with your hand forward, straight at the head, that's a fairly aggressive posture. Mm -hmm. And for birds, it's a disaster because they have spent all their time grooming themselves to have waterproof um, coating and sunproof coating. And if you do that, you destroy all that layer. And of course, in Galaos, it means uh, that's powdered down. You take their, their makeup off, as right. you like. So that would be one thing to reduce fear. If you want to, they groom each other around the, the ear, there. That's and back of the neck, and they absolutely love it. And that follow, and it gives a signal to the bird that you are a friend, you're doing something nice to me. You're not trying to harm me or take me away or butcher me or eat me. And uh, so that's number one. You don't want a cage sitting on a television set. A mm -hmm. uh, number of times I've seen that. It's no. unbelievable. But no. the light and, and birds like to be higher up. Yes. Than human eye level. Yeah. So if they're low down, they're in a constant state of stress. If they're higher up, they can relax. They've got mm -hmm. the situation under control. So there, there are many things. And again, it's perspective taking, you know, well, what do birds do in the wild? They don't sit on the ground at night, do they? They sit in a roost mm -hmm. high up and they protect themselves somehow. So they have a dark corner and they have a light corner. Uh, they have a way to escape mm -hmm. and they calculate that into their daily life. So these are just minor little things. They seem minor. And then we started off with the clothing. You know, if you don't wear bright red and, uh, and uh, green hair standing up like that without frightening a, a bird mm -hmm. but you try to uh, and and you would move slowly generally you have to move more slowly than you used to. Mm -hmm. and particularly the hands are weapon we have hands that are weapons so yes. Uh, yes. I always hold them away and they step readily on the back of the hand but if you do that they don't right because okay. They understand that you can grab them. Yeah. So uh, yeah. there are many ways. And of course, you know, we can talk about cages and cage sizes and access to the family and who is in it and uh, what you do when children, when you have three little children that all screech half a day, and what that does to the poor bird, because it's sort of the unpredictability of all children. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if that's the right time for, for children to have bird pets, they should probably start with something that can get away more easily, mm -hmm. like a robust dog and that can wander away. But uh, to start with a bird can be a bit bad for the bird. I agree. Not necessarily agree. for the child, but no, uh, the bird. they I might need to be a bit... Uh, the, I'm talking about the bird. <laughs> I always remember the birds that have come to me and uh, forget the names of the people, which is terribly <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I know, I know. Me too. <laughs> so, um, anyway. I, I, I want to, uh, I, I so hope that you agree to meet with us again. I should probably ask you off camera, but I just, I can't wait till we get to meet again and talk about some very uh some body language because the one thing that i feel like birds give so much body language that uh i mean they talk nothing but body but they have learned some of our language to try to yep. integrate and ingratiate themselves with us i think they do a marvelous job at really working their the the people and their surroundings to try to be to try to get along in, in the world and so i really want and hope that you will help those of us who seek to understand uh parrot language the the differences between personality personality we have personality of a parrot um 
that shows their um, comedic side, uh, their desires of, of preference. But then we have the base of the bird that is in their DNA, that is who they are because they were built that way, because that's their species. And I think that people need to understand before they ever adopt a bird of any sort that they have to understand something about their DNA. So if they see an African gray scratching at the floor, they understand what that's about um, uh, and why you don't c create dark hidey holes for them underneath couches oh. or, or, or boxes because uh, then you can get some behaviors you weren't counting on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 I know because... I'd, I I'd love to show you some images if we talk again, uh, some images on how you can read the expression in parrots. And because we are uh, in our own species, we tend to look at eyes and we tend to look at the mouth. Right. But in uh, in uh, birds and particularly in parrots and cockatoos, you look at the posture and head movement and feather movement. Feathers. And each feather movement means something, and they have yep. so many different signals that uh, exactly at the back and where at the back and how they do it and, and their uh, tails and once uh, and yeah and. And once you know that, you can tell exactly whether you have a friendly bird, uh, a stressed bird, an ill bird uh, on your hands, and your success rate will go up enormously in communicating with a bird. It's just to read another language, if you like, mm -hmm. in communication, and, but it's just as rich as ours. And you don't have to... Um, you can... You, I don't know why humans think they're so smart that they come magically equipped with understanding bird language or how to have a bird. It's not intuitive to humans. As a predator, an apex predator does not understand prey behavior, in my humble opinion. It doesn't need to understand prey behavior if you want to eat it. Exactly. Who cares what they feel? <laughs> well, and, so, and you know, that that's is part of the problem. High on the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yes. part of the problem is that we have grown accustomed to not having to care or not care. Um, that they don't want to step up, but we force them to step up anyway. And then we get upset because they bite us. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, you know, uh, to have exposure to animals and become friends with your own pet yes. changes your yes. outlook on the natural world yes, it can does. I change your outlook completely yes so okay. it's a valuable okay. thing to do yeah okay let me um oh my goodness I have just loved this conversation let me just check real quick to see because uh, we're running out of time like a minute we've got one minute time. yeah yeah so let me check and see if we have any questions um oh we have no questions so I haven't I haven't used up all the time uh, un unnecessarily for people, but um, thank you so much. I, I don't know why I've said that ad nauseum, but I really appreciate your time and, and your knowledge and look forward to meeting with you again. And I know that you're going out of town, I think, um, at the end of the week, and I, I hope that you have uh, a safe and successful journey. And we'll talk again soon. That'll be lovely. Enjoy talking to you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, we'll talk soon. Yeah. We'll do. Bye. Thank you. Bye.